Hello, everyone. Um, this week's lectures are on chapter 13. We are on the final three chapters of the course. Today, we're going to cover uh, Newton's universal law of gravity or um, a mathematical description of gravity for any two objects anywhere in the universe and as many objects as we want, actually. And then we're going to discuss Johann Kepler and Kepler's famous three laws of planetary rotation. And from that, we're going to understand, hopefully, um, we're going to develop a new set of equations and mathematical concepts and physics concepts that govern the rotation of an object around a central force. And that central force is going to be gravity. OK, um, before we do that, we need to go back and kind of talk about what we've been doing. and how we're going to change what we've been doing. So throughout this course, we've said that an object near the surface of the Earth has something called a force or weight acting on it due to gravity. So the weight of some object is mg. And like all forces, this is a mass times acceleration. And therefore, we see that A is g. And we assume that G was always 9.81 meters per second squared, which it turns out is actually the average value of the acceleration due to gravity from the Earth um, acting at the surface of the Earth. And we're going to discuss why that's an average, um, how the force of gravity actually varies at different positions around the Earth, and a few other concepts. A lot of that we're going to wait and discuss in the second video. But for now, I want to um, just refresh your memory that when we talked about weight, we assumed that gravity had an acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared, that that was constant, which doesn't really make sense because the force actually depends on how far away the two masses are from each other. But we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's recall how we determined the potential energy of gravity from this force, this weight force. Um, so we said that, for example, if we had an object at some height initial, so y initial was h and y final, it fell, and y final was zero. We knew that the work done by any force is F dot D, which simply means that the force times the parallel component of the displacement. That's easy enough. The force is mg, as we've already said. The displacement here is y final minus y initial. Okay. And we see from this that um, this ends up being. Um, essentially mg times zero minus h, okay? But the force of gravity is actually negative. So we get a negative times a negative and we get a positive. Um, so um, this is actually um, assuming that y positive is up and g is down, we know that the work is MGH from the potential energy. Uh, another way that we did this was we said the energy at the top, if it assumed to start with an initial velocity of zero and a final velocity unknown, we could determine the final velocity because the work is not only equal to MG of Y final minus Y initial with a negative sign. Um, it's equal to the change in kinetic energy, which means the mv final squared over 2 minus mv initial squared over 2. And from these two equations, we have that mv initial squared over 2 plus mg y initial is equal to um, mv final squared over 2 plus mg y final 
Now we already said that y final would be zero and y initial or v initial was zero. And we got that the v final should be two g y initial or simply two g h. Um, so what this is showing is that gravity is actually doing positive work as a particle moves in the same direction as the force of gravity. And the force of gravity was down. So as the object moves down, it gains energy due to the work done by gravity. That energy translates into a change in kinetic energy because it's positive work. Um, we get a positive change in velocity. If we moved up, we would get a negative. Um, so if we move against the force of gravity, we do negative work. We need to remember those things. Um, and the final thing that we need to remember is that the force is actually the partial differential with respect to displacement of the potential energy. We look at this, we know the potential energy is mgh. We take the partial differential with respect to h, we get mg. Um, we're going to need to use that later as well to determine what the potential energy of gravity is in universal gravity. Um, it's all stuff we've done before. I just want to make sure that we remember how we did all that. Um, and we're going to apply those same ideas to universal gravity. So let's talk about Newton. Now, we had the example or the kind of mythic story that Newton saw an apple fall to the ground or it fell and hit him on the head. And he suddenly came up with the law of gravity. Um, but the problem Newton was actually trying to solve was what happens if you have two masses and these two masses are isolated, um, meaning they're the only things in the universe. If these two objects were the only things in the universe and object one has big M and object two has little m, there'll be a reason why I'm, I'm calling them that in a minute. But he reasoned that if there were two objects, they would attract each other with the same force of gravity. So big M would be attracted by the force of gravity of, uh, the force of gravity on big M due to little m and little m would be attracted with a force of gravity of little m on big m. So he recognized quite early that this had to be a third law pair. These things had to be equal. And this is just Newton's third law that says the force of gravity of A acting on B or A due to B is equal to the force of gravity of B on B due to A. <coughs> That is our first um, really important idea, that gravity is an opposite and equal third law pair between any objects in the universe. Um, it's gonna turn out that gravity is a long range force and it's always present, um, but it's actually um, the big long range force. There's four forces, four key, forces in the universe. There's gravity, which we're talking about today. There's the electromagnetic force between charged particles, which we'll talk about next semester. And then there's something called the strong and weak nuclear forces. And what those govern is forces between protons that hold atoms together and how radiation um, actually works. So, um, we're only going to talk about gravity in this course and then you'll get electromagnetism the coulomb force between two charged electric particles next semester but what you'll find is that gravity is actually the long range force it affects all objects in the universe it's actually pretty weak compared to the electric force at short di distances but at long range gravity uh, on the scale of solar systems and universes um, and um, galaxies has a huge effect on how the universe works. Um, so Newton 
reason that any two objects would attract each other was something called a force of gravity. And he had to come up with what this force actually should be. So he reasoned that it must depend on both masses and it must depend on the square of the distance between them. So this distance from M to M is R. And lastly, there's a constant called G and G is the gravitational constant. Um, it's, it makes the um, so scale factor. So G, since this has to equal Newton's, and this is kilograms squared over meters squared, G must have units of Newton's meters squared over kilograms squared, and it has a value of 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11. Um, that is very, very small. It's a very small scale factor, but gravity usually needs, for significant gravity, you need significant masses and um, pretty close distances, but we'll see that as it, as it develops. So we have this force uh, of gravity that's G times two masses. I wanna rewrite this, however, as M times G, times m over r squared. And the reason why I want to do this is if this is the force of gravity on little m due to big M, then we can see that if this is an ma force, which all forces are, that a is actually equal to g times the mass that is causing the gravity um, divided by the squared radius between them. You know, if you write this this way, you'll always remember that this is actually the mass that is causing gravity, and this is the mass that we're concerned with the dynamics. Um, we want to know what the acceleration of this mass is. That is our mass. So if you were an astronaut falling into the sun, this would be your mass, and this would be the mass of the sun. Um, if you're worried about your weight on the surface or on the top of some mountain on Earth, this would be your mass, this would be the mass of the Earth. So this big M in the acceleration is always the object causing the um, acceleration due to gravity. So let's look at that really fast. Um, and we're gonna write that is, so imagine you're on the surface of the Earth and the force of gravity acting on you due to the earth is your mass times g times m of the earth over the distance from the center of the earth to you. Um, so your acceleration is g times the mass of the earth, and I guess I could put e for the earth here, earth divided by r squared. And that's gonna be pretty big because the mass of the earth is 5.97 times 10 to the 24th. The force of gravity on you is equal to the force of gravity on the earth due to you. And that would be the mass of the earth times G times your mass over R squared. And so the acceleration acting on the earth is actually G times your mass times R squared. And your mass would be, I don't know, 50 kilograms, let's say. So your mass is much, much smaller than the Earth. And therefore, the acceleration you give to the Earth due to your mass, due to the force of gravity um, acting on the Earth because of your mass, will be very, very small um, compared to the acceleration that the Earth gives to you. We'll actually run those numbers in a little bit, but um, I really, really want you to try to write it as this idea that the acceleration is G times the mass of the causing the acceleration divided by the radial distance squared. So let's do a quick example. Say we have a 100 kilogram mass floating in a region of space with an absolute vacuum. And 
a thousand meters away, there's a two kilogram mass. And we want to know what is the force of gravity acting on these two. So the force of gravity, let's call this A, and we'll call this one B. The force of gravity on A due to B, and we want to know the force of gravity on B due to A. And then <coughs> we also want to know um, what is the acceleration of each. So the force of gravity on either of them is simply going to be G times M of A, M of B over R squared. And we know that this is 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11. This is 100. This is 2 over 1,000, or 1 times 10 to the third squared. So um, if we pull out our calculator, we find that this is 2 times 6.673 um, times 10 to the minus 9 divided by 10 to the 6. Um, so that's actually going to be 1.33. This is 10 to the 11th. This is 10 squared. So this becomes 10 to the minus 9 over 10 to the 6 becomes 10 to the minus 15, um, which is actually uh, 10 to the minus 14. In your calculator, you get 13.3 when you pull this. Newtons. That is a very, very small amount of gravity, a very small gravitational force between these two objects. But let's look at the acceleration. Well, before we do that, the force of gravity of A on B, um, or A due to B, is 1.33 times 10 to the minus 14 Newtons. The force of gravity on B due to A is also 1.33 times 10 to the minus 14 Newtons. Although note that the force of gravity on mass B is going to be negative. These are equal and opposite pairs. It's going to act in the radial distance toward A. Um, that's a little important. It turns out to be not super important when we talk about rotational motion, and we'll see that later. The main idea here is that the force of gravity is the same on both of them. Uh, the acceleration, however, on A is equal to G times the mass of B over R squared. And another way to say that is it's equal to the force divided by mass A, right? Um, so this would be 1.33 times 10 to the minus four divided by 100 which is easy to see is 1.33 times 10 to the minus 16 newtons. Not too bad. Um, the acceleration of B is equal to G times M of A over R squared. The mass causing gravity um, on B, which is again the force divided by the mass of B, which is half of this value, which is, uh, 6.56-ish, um, 5, 6, times 10 to the minus 15 Newtons uh, with a negative sign, if you want. Um, so you can see that here, this is about 100 times greater than the force act or the acceleration of A. The acceleration of B is about 100 times greater than the acceleration of A. This is the same reason why when you're standing on the surface of the Earth, the Earth pulls you down with an acceleration of G, but you don't pull the Earth up, the center of mass of the Earth up with an acceleration of G. It's very, very small, and we're going to compute that in a minute. But um, what I want you to take away from this, forces are equal and opposite. The accelerations are not. The accelerations are vastly different for each mass. Um, so let's look at gravity on the surface of the Earth. Now, if the Earth were a sphere, a perfect sphere, the center of mass of the Earth would always be a distance r away. So no matter where you stood on the Earth, you would be at a distance r, and the force of gravity acting on you at every point 
would be the mass of the Earth times your mass over the radius of the Earth squared. However, we have a few problems um, with that. Problem number one is that the Earth isn't a perfect circle. It's actually something called an oblate spheroid, which means that it's kind of smushed. And the radial uh, distance at the equator is greater than the radial distance at the pole. The radial distance at the equator is what we normally use, um, 6.388 times 10 to the sixth meters. The radial distance at the pole is only 6.357 times 10 to the six meters. And as you can see from this equation, if you're at the pole where the radius is smaller, you're going to have a greater force of gravity. So the force of gravity at the poles is greater than the force of gravity at the equator. Um, if we go through and try to figure out what these are, so, the force of gravity acting on you at the equator. Let's pretend you have a mass of 600 kilograms, okay? And the Earth has a mass of 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Remember that G is 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 Newtons uh, meters squared over kilograms squared, okay? So at the equator, the force acting on you would be G times mass of the Earth times your mass over R at the equator squared. And this is 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 times 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms times our 60 divided by um, 6.388 times 10 to the six meters. And this ends up, if you use your calculator, um, being 6.673 times 5.97 times six divided by 6.388 times 6.388 is five, uh, something's off there. Um, point six. Uh, no, it's not. I'm sorry. Um, and this ends up being five point eight six times what? Five point eight six newtons, but it's going to be times something. Ten to the minus eleven plus ten to the twenty fourth is ten to the thirteenth plus ten is 10 to the 14th. 10 to the 6 times 10 to the 6 is 10 to the 12th. So this is times 10 squared. And we get that the force of gravity acting at the equator is 586 newtons. That is your weight at the equator is 586 newtons. The acceleration, again, because ma is equal to the force, then A is equal to the force divided by your mass, would be 586 divided by 60, and that would give us um, 9.77 meter per second squared. So we can see that even if we use the standard average radius of the Earth, the 6.388 radial distance at the equator, we don't get 9.81. We in fact only get 9.77. So let's do this again for the polar distance. Um, on the pole, we have that the radius of the pole is 6.357 times 10 to the six meters. The other values stay the same. So the force of gravity acting at the pole is um, let me actually rewrite that as big G, is G times the mass of the Earth times your mass over the radius at the pole squared. And this is 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 times 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms for the mass of the Earth, 60 kilograms for your mass over 
6.357 times 10 to the 6 squared. When we do this, um, we get a force of 6.673 times 5.97 times 6 divided by 6.357 times 6.357 or uh, 591 newtons. Again, 10 to the minus 11 plus our uh, minus 11 plus 24 plus 1 is 14 over 12 would be uh, multiplying whatever you get for the coefficients by 100. So we get that your weight at the pole is 591 newtons and your acceleration is the force over your mass or 591 newtons over 60 kilograms or 591 divided by 60, 9.85 meters per second squared. So we got that at the equator, it was 9.77 meters squared. And at the pole, it was 9.85, okay? And so you can see quite clearly, you add those two numbers together and divide by two, you're going to get 9.81, um, roughly. Um, <clears throat> 0.77. Plus 0.85 divided by 2 is 9.81. Okay. So uh, that explains why we generally just assume that G is 9.81. However, there's a couple things, and we're going to talk about this far more next lecture. There's a couple things that actually affect what gravity is besides only the force of gravity. We're making a few assumptions. In general, we're making the assumption that the Earth is a sphere, um, a perfect sphere, and it's not. It's an oblate spheroid. We're assuming that there's uniform density to the material in the Earth, and that's definitely not true. Um, so with those two assumptions, um, things could go wrong. But I want to talk about all of that much later. I want to talk about that in the next video when we actually talk about gravity inside the Earth and a few of the problems that Newton had trying to formulate gravity for all cases. But for now, I just want to introduce uh, this concept of a universal gravity. The second thing we need, if we have a universal gravity, we need to be able to figure out how much work that force would do. So if the force is G times M, M over R squared, we need to figure out how much work this force would do over some displacement from say r initial to r final okay and it turns out that that really depends on what direction we're going you may have noticed that i don't like to write vectors i don't like to write little vector signs and that's because you have to be very clear in what direction you're talking about so imagine we have some big mass, m, right? And we have some little m here. And the work that we do this way, when we displace this way, and the work that we do this way, this work would be positive. Because as it falls towards this mass, the force of gravity is actually going to be adding energy to m, little m. And as we pull it away, the force of gravity is going to be taking energy away. Energy being a change in kinetic energy. So it's going to speed up as we move to the left. It's going to slow down as it moves to the right, assuming big M here can't uh, move at all. And we're only concerned with the acceleration of little m. So um, before we do that, let's talk about what exactly is the kinetic energy or the work due to this force. So remember that I said the force was the change in displacement, I'm gonna use R, of the potential energy, okay? If we wanna find the potential energy, we can find the potential energy is equal to the force times the uh, partial of R. We can turn these into true derivatives. So F D R 
and then taking this to be the initial to final potential energy and this being r initial to r final the force is g m m over r squared times dr this stuff is a constant the integral of dx over x squared is equal to um, and I'm going to leave off the coefficient. I'm just going to do this really fast. This is x to the minus 2. So add one power and divide by the new power. And so we get this is equal to negative 1 over x, right? Therefore, this um, change of u, the change of u becomes g times m m over r from r initial to r final. Or another way of saying that. This becomes g m m over r final minus g m m over r initial. But now we have a problem. Um, because remember when we did the potential energy of gravity, we had this weird negative sign. We had that the potential energy of gravity was mgh final minus mgh initial but the work was negative okay we're going to have that same kind of issue here and this is the one big hurdle that we have to clear on rotational uh, potential energy universal gravity is that the signs are a little bit weird um, and why they're weird i'm going to talk about right now so imagine we have these same two masses some big m right and some little m. And we need the potential energy of gravity to be zero when it's very far away. So when it's very far away, it needs to be zero. So when r goes to infinity, which of these terms becomes zero? Well, we have that the potential energy of gravity is g m m over r final minus g m m over r initial. So let's say that initially, this is at infinity. And when we move it in, it should lose potential energy and gain kinetic energy, okay? That's where things get a little weird. So if we initially say that R is at zero, we get that the change, and it moves to some R is R final, we get that the change in potential energy, and I really should call this change, is g m m over r minus zero. Because if our initial is infinity, this term becomes zero. And we see that we gained positive energy from the potential energy. Um, this number is positive. Therefore, our work needs to be g m m over r final minus g m m over r initial okay that has to be the work done now let's double check that that's true and imagine we start at r initial is r and we move to r final is infinity then our change of u is g m m over infinity minus g m m over r and this becomes zero and we see that we took energy out of the system so we had to take energy out of the system because we were fighting gravity the work done by gravity gravity is trying to pull this object this way at all times so this is the force of gravity and the work here this is our d and this is our d the work is f dot d, here they're in the same direction, here they're in opposite directions. So as we move outward, we do negative work. Again, u is going to be equal to the change in kinetic energy, which is equal to mv final squared over two minus mv initial squared over two. Um, so as long as this work is positive, we get a positive change in kinetic energy, which is a positive change in velocity. If it's negative, we get a negative change. And from all that, what you need to remember is that 
the work done by gravity is the change in kinetic energy is equal to the change in u of big g and so this becomes mv final squared over two minus mv initial squared over two is equal to g m m over um, the force causing it g m m over r um, final minus g m little m over r initial um, let's call these initials knots okay and that shows that we get um, m v initial over two minus g m m over r initial okay these m's are the same little m's is equal to m v final squared over two minus g m m over r final so before we would have written m v initial squared over two plus m g h initial is equal to m v final squared over two plus m g h final but note that these have a negative sign when we're talking about universal gravitation and the reason for that is we actually had to choose where our zero was um, and we had to choose it when the potential energy was zero um, the potential energy is obviously zero when the two masses are very 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 far apart and that told us um, that our final if if r was infinity we get a zero term and that kind of guided our sign convention here um, it's a little thing but it's probably the one hurdle that people um, mess up is remembering that there's going to be a negative sign here um, other than that most of this we're going to talk about next time we're going to talk about how satellites when a satellite rotates around the earth if you change the height that it's orbiting at uh, we'll talk about how the potential energy and the kinetic energy of that satellite the kinetic energy of rotation i should say of the satellite changes um, but that's all stuff i want to talk about next time i really just wanted to introduce this concept that the potential energy is given by this equation right here okay not too big of a deal um, but it's different from what we've done and therefore i wanted to make sure you all kind of understood it before we start talking about orbits okay so now we're going to back up to how we discovered how the planets orbit and this is actually one of my favorite stories in physics um, i urge you to go and investigate these stories for yourself the history of physics is actually really interesting but um, if we go back and before newton there was a, an astronomer named tycho brahe in europe and tycho brahe was actually um, a researcher he what he was doing was every night he would go to his observatory with basically a protractor an astrolab um, or whatever it was but he could measure the angle and the height of every star that he could see and he meticulously night after night cataloged where each star was because he was looking for comets so the stars never change they never uh, they rotate because the earth is rotating but their positions relative to one another never change so anything that moved he knew could be a comet why was he looking for comets well they they weren't absolutely sure um, how comets influenced a lot of things whether they influenced the earth whether they influenced anything else it was um, a less enlightened time so knowing where comets were kind of um, lets you figure out some of the influence the things influencing the universe uh, which is all a bit of saying he might have been a little bit into witchcraft um, as we would call it now but he was looking for comets 
they knew the planets were the planets. Um, so he knew that Venus and Jupiter and Mars and Mercury, if he could see it, I'm not sure that he could see Mercury because it's very low, because it's very close to the sun, but um, he knew that they were planets. He kept detailed notes on where they were day after day. And his notes were pretty meticulous. He um, ends up having an assistant named Johannes Kepler. And Kepler is not an astronomer. He is a mathematician. And now here's where the story gets kind of fun. When Brahe dies, he might have been poisoned. And he might have been poisoned by Kepler to get the data. Um, I think they made some movies about it. I know they exhumed uh, Brahe trying to determine it. But basically, everyone had mercury in their system. So the fact that Brahe had mercury isn't a smoking gun that Kepler killed him. Uh, but he may have. Regardless, he got all of Brahe's data from Brahe's wife. And he set about trying to determine the orbit of the planets. And now here's where things get a little more interesting. So Kepler was a big believer that the universe had to be perfect. That meant that things orbited, the planets had to orbit in perfect circles. And he wanted to prove that. And so as he sets out and he starts looking at all the data from the Jupiter and Saturn and Venus and Mars, and Mercury, if he had it, he starts to realize that they're not circles. Um, he's not sure what to do because he's, he doesn't know if maybe Brahe didn't actually do a very good job noting where the planets were, or maybe Kepler's own equations are wrong. And he spends a lot of time working on it. And finally, he comes to the conclusion that nope, Brahe did it to his job and Kepler's equations are sound. The problem is that planets rotate in something called an ellipse. And so Kepler sets down his laws, and those laws begin with his famous first law, which is simply that the planets orbit in ellipses. Um, so we need to talk about what an ellipse is. I'm sure you all probably got it in seventh grade, and you probably have forgotten since then. Um, there's not a lot of use of ellipses. Um, so we need to, to re, recall our math on ellipses. This is the most important part of planetary orbits, because if you can't uh, understand, uh, understand and describe an ellipse, you can't describe an orbit. So we need to start there. So an ellipse looks like a circle that is squashed, meaning that it's um, radius is vertical radius and its horizontal radius are different. We say that this radius from the center out is A and this is B. And A is something called the semi-major axis. B is actually the semi-minor, but we don't really actually care about B. Another idea is that there are two foci, F1 and F2. And these lie at some distance. Um, so A goes from here center out. Um, this distance is some coefficient called E times A. Uh, the E is the eccentricity. Uh, this point I'm going to call A, and this point I'm going to call B. And the distance from foci one to A is something called the perihelion distance. So actually, let me go back and rename these P and A um, for perihelion and aphelion. The distance from foci one all the way to the point A here is called the aphelion distance. That's all we need. Um, there's a few other formulas with ellipses, um, notably that the area is pi AB. But for now, all you need to know is that from the center out is called the semi-major axis. If we go from the center to foci one, we get something called the eccentricity E times A. 
E will be obviously less than A, so, or E will be, um, EA will be less than A, so E is going to be less than one. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And that the aphelion distance is the distance from foci one to the opposite side of the ellipse. The perihelion distance is the distance from foci one to the near. So RP is the nearest approach to F1. RA is the furthest approach. Um, P is perihelion. And A is aphelion. These are Greek words, I believe. Uh, for near and farthest from the sun. Helios is the sun. Helion comes from Helios. So Kepler's first law was that the planets orbit in ellipses and and that the sun is at foci one, and at foci two, there is nothing. That is Kepler's first law. He found that the planets had to be orbiting in ellipses. The sun is at one foci, and at the other foci, there's nothing. Okay, um, that's it. Pretty easy to understand, but no one had phrased it that way before. So let's talk about what this means for planets. We set the sun somewhere here. Let's say we're talking about the Earth. When the Earth is closest to the sun, the Earth is said to be at perihelion. When the Earth is furthest from the sun, it's said to be at aphelion. This distance, A, is the semi-major axis. We're actually going to talk about that. For the Earth, it has a certain name. And this distance, EA, is the eccentricity times the semi-major axis. This distance from the sun is our perihelion, since this is also A. And this distance from the sun to the furthest away the Earth gets is the aphelion. And from these, we can develop some really simple math, um, just adding some stuff together. You can see that 2a has to be the perihelion plus the aphelion distance. Here to here is a, here to here is a, here to here is rp, here to here is ra. Secondly, we can see that a here is equal to rp plus ea. So let's get a, um, equation for RP and RA in terms of EA. And we'll talk about that, why we care about EA so much in a minute. But here we can see that RP is A minus EA, or it's A times one minus E. And RA, how we get that is if we plug this in here, we will get A minus EA, move them over, we will get A plus EA. So this is A, plus one plus E. And that's obvious because from here to here is A, from here to here is EA, and that has to be RA. Um, these two equations and their various, um, various ways, usually you're given two of those. You're given E and A, let's say, and you wanna find RP or RA, or you're given RA and A, and you wanna find RP, or you're given whatever. These are important because an astronomer can actually look at uh, two stars rotating around each other or an exosolar planet rotating around a distant star and measure RA and RP. Um, there's actually ways to determine how far away uh, distant stars are called standard candles. But this initially is pretty easy to do just by watching the star through one orbit and seeing how far away it gets and how close it gets. Um, there might be some geometry you have to do, meaning we're assuming we're looking at this flat. And if you were in an angle, you might have to do a few tricks. But in general, you can observe these values and measure them yourself. Um, nothing too hard about that. So um, let's talk about eccentricity. <clears throat> 
imagine that we have a circle. So we have an ellipse that was a circle and therefore RP and RA are both R. These are both R. If that's the case, then E is zero. And if E is zero, then we get a circle. So whenever the eccentricity of an ellipse, although it's not really an ellipse, it's a circle, if the eccentricity is zero, you have a circle. For an ellipse, we just talked about it. Um, e has to be greater than zero, but less than one. Here you get an ellipse. And if E happens to be one, exactly one, you get something called a parabola. And this is when something comes in, like a comet, say, shoots around the sun and leaves. A lot of comets are actually in elliptical orbits, but something could come flying in, pass around the sun and leave. Parabolas are not closed. They're not closed orbits, um, unlike an ellipse or a circle. And finally, if E is greater than one, and you get a hyperbola. And I'm not really gonna talk about hyperbolas other than to say they are much steeper ellipses, essentially. Um, so the eccentricity governs what type of orbit you have. As long as E is from zero to one, we have ellipses. Um, I don't know of anything that's a circle. We do have some things that will be close. So let's talk about that really fast. Um, so the planets, the known eccentricity of the planets, um, I'm sure most of you know that Pluto was demoted from being a planet. One of the reasons why is the eccentricity. So let's put these in two groups. Um, we're gonna start off with Mercury. Mercury is the planet closest to the sun. It's very small and its eccentricity is 0 0.206. Venus, has an eccentricity of almost zero. Um, so the orbit of Venus has an eccentricity of 007. These are E, by the way. Which means it's almost in circular, a circular orbit. The Earth is also almost circular, but a bit larger than Venus. And Venus is a lot closer. In fact, Venus is the most nearly circular orbit of all the planets in our solar system. Um, Mars is 0 0.093. Um, Jupiter is 0 0.048. Uh, Saturn is 0. Point, sorry. Saturn is 0 0.056. And Uranus and Neptune, Uranus and Neptune, 0.047 and 0 0.009. Neptune is also almost a perfect circle. And then finally we have Pluto and Pluto out here is 0 0.248. So if we look at this, we can see that the eccentricity of Mercury and Pluto are over 200 times, or about 200 times, 200 times, well, maybe not 200, um, <laughs> significantly larger than Venus. In fact, they're both over 0.2. Why Mercury's eccentricity is so high is it's very close to the sun. There's some relativistic effects and some other things happening to Mercury, which cause it to have um, such a high eccentricity. Essentially, it's kind of rotating around the sun, but not in a circle. Pluto, on the other hand, actually, if the sun's here, it comes in and leaves kind of wide. Uh, the rest of the planets all sit in the plane, but Pluto has this weird eccentricity. It's actually inclined to the plane, and it's obviously not the same as the planets. That you can tell just by its orbit. 
The other thing that this tells you is this tells you that these planets formed in the solar system. Since they're nearly circular, um, that they formed in the same disk of material that our sun formed in. Pluto may have been caught or it may have fallen in from the outer edge, whatever it is. It did not form in this same plane. So these planets all are related basically by their eccentricity. You could also look at their angle, but um, that's something that you can talk about in an astronomy course. We're not going to talk about it here. Although this idea is really important. Um, it's, it factors into things later. Okay. So now, what was Kepler's second law? And Kepler's second law is going to be kind of fun because Newton fixed it. <laughs> so Kepler's second law was merely an observation. And that observation, I mean, it was a mathematical observation, but that observation was that as a planet passes from point A to point B, okay, and then in some similar time, it passes from another A to B. So we say the change of time here and the change of time here, um, in that similar time span, this area, the area of this and the area of this, so call that area one and this area two, area one is equal to A2. And what that means is equal area in equal time. That was how he formulated it. Equal area in equal um, time. And the consequence of this is if we look, this has to travel a further distance in the same time than this. Okay. So let's call this S1 and this S2, the arc length from A to B here. So V1 is S1 over delta T, and V2 is S2 over delta T, and the times are the same. So what that tells you is that V1 has to be greater than V2. Or that when objects orbit near, when they're near the mass that they're rotating around, they move faster. And when they're further away, they move slower. But equal area and equal time is uh, how he stated the law. And we're going to actually state it in a different way. So let's look at something really fast. And imagine that you have along this line. So this is our RA and this is our RP. And we have some small change in V. And we have some. Um, I'm drawing this big for you. This and this change of V would be um, effectively uh, infinitesimal. Okay. If equal area equal time is true, the area of this triangle is one half base times height. So this would say that one half the change in V times R A is equal to one half the change in V. I'm going to call this A and call this P. VP, RP. You cancel those twos and you see that VA, RA has to be equal to VP, RP. Um, or VA is equal to RP over RA. <clears throat> and remember that RA is smaller than RP, so this is going to be greater than one. So RP over RA is greater than one, that means that VA is going to be faster than VP. Kind of cool little consequence, but we can do better in deriving it. Um, Newton's version of Kepler's second law. Imagine a point particle traveling at some distance r from an axis of rotation. So this is some m, it's traveling at some v, we know that the angular momentum is r cross p and p is mv and r cross p gives us m v r if we assume that v is r omega um, we should also note that this is m 
omega r squared, where omega is the angular velocity. Um, but for now, let's let that be. This is therefore m r squared omega, which is i omega, which is also what angular momentum is. But if we assume that the angular momentum is conserved from perihelion to aphelion, then we get that m times b of p r of p is equal to m times b of a r of a, which is exactly what we found here if we cancel the masses, that b p r p is equal to v a r a. And so if we go back and look at these, we got that rp was a one minus e, ra was one plus e. We can see that here, if vp is equal to ra over rp times um, va, that this is equal to a times one plus e over a times one minus e, va, or simply, um, one plus e over one minus e times va. And therefore, if you knew the eccentricity alone and the perihelion velocity, you could find the aphelion velocity. Or better yet, you could actually solve this for e, um, which let me do that really fast for you. Um, so we just found that VP was one plus E over one minus E times VA, okay? And you could actually multiply through by one minus E, VP one minus E is equal to VA one plus E. And therefore, if I move these over, um, I get that VP minus VA is equal to um, VA plus VP times E, or that E is equal to VP minus VA over VP plus VA. And so if I knew what um, VP and VA are, which I could find from studying Doppler shifts, the way the light shifts when an object moves towards us or away from us, I could find the eccentricity of the orbit of some exosolar planet or star. Um, pretty cool, pretty useful. It's something that when we do these types of problems, this is something that you would probably have to do. Given VP and VA, I would ask for E, let's say. Um, once you know E, you can find um, all sorts of other things. But in general, these are plug and chug problems. Uh, you just start with those equations that we found. RP and RA is equal to A times one minus E is equal to A times one plus E. Um, and the fact that VP is whatever it was, RA over RP, VA, and you can find the velocity um, pretty easily and find these distances pretty easily. In general, you're going to need to know RP, RA, VP, and VA by the end of a problem to understand the energy and the potential energy, <coughs> perhaps the angular momentum. But there's one last thing that we can talk about, and that is the period. Turns out Kepler's third law is something he noticed. And there's a nice, quick subtlety here that we'll talk about in a minute. But Kepler found that the period squared, and by period, we mean the, um, the uh, time it takes to orbit once. So the period of the Earth is one year. Kepler found for our solar system that the period squared was equal to a cubed in our solar system. We'll talk about that. But this is Kepler's third law, is that the period squared is proportional. So if we actually write this as proportional to a cubed. 
Um, we'll talk about how that works and we'll talk about a really nice, simple version of that for our solar system only. But um, we'll get there. So we're going to derive it first. We know that omega, the time it takes to go around once for one full orbit is two pi over the period. Okay. Secondly, we know that a rad is v squared over r, if you remember that um, from way back when. So if a object is rotating around, it's subject to a force with a radial acceleration of a rad. If we assume this is rolling without slipping and we apply this for r omega, we get r squared omega squared over r, which is r omega squared. And our force is m a rad, right? But this force is also the force of gravity. So if we have the force of gravity is equal to the force um, of rotation here, this radial force, we get the G, big M, whatever we're rotating around, R M over R. And we're going to say that this distance is actually A. So over A squared is equal to R um, little m R omega squared, M times V squared over R canceling the little m's um, and noting that this r is actually an a for the semi-major axis. Now keep in mind that this is not an acceleration. This is sem uh, the um, this is a semi-major axis, not semi-major axis, not acceleration. Okay. So here, if I cancel those, I get the G big M over, move this down, over A to the third is equal to omega squared. But omega squared, we said was two pi over T. So we get the G big M over A cubed is equal to four pi squared over the period squared. And therefore, from this, we see that the period squared is actually four pi squared over G times whatever we're rotating around times the semi-major axis of the orbit um, cubed. Now, um, that is one way to derive it. That's the way I believe your book derives it. There are a million ways to derive this law. There's, it's actually kind of cool, um, but we're gonna show something even, even nicer about this law here. So um, in our solar system, we need to talk about um, a few variables that we haven't really brought up. So the mass of the sun is often written in astronomy as this mass with this circle and a dot, that is 1.99 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Um, the mass of the earth we've already used today, 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Um, and we said that G was 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 um, kilogram or Newtons meters squared over kilograms squared. Um, the only other thing that you really, well, you might want to remember that the radius of the earth is 6.388 times 10 to the six meters at the equator, which is usually just assumed to be the radius of the earth. But the last thing, and one of the most important things is the distance from the earth to the sun the semi-major axis distance is actually what we call one AU. Now, note that's not RP, that's not the perihelion distance, and that's not the aphelion distance. This is the semi-major axis, the distance from the center of the ellipse to the edge is one AU. Um, 
And one AU turns out to be 1.5-ish times 10 to the 11th meters. That is how far on average the Earth is away from the sun at any time. Now, when we use the period squared, and the period of the Earth is um, 365 uh, days, actually 365 and a quarter. If you turn that into minutes, remember that we can use pi times 10 to the seventh seconds. I'm sorry, seconds, not minutes. Uh, the period of one year on Earth. So this is one Earth year, one Earth year. And usually when we talk about periods of planets, we put them in Earth years. Now here's the rather cool thing. If, um, if you want, you can figure out for say the Earth, what this is. You could plug in G, plug in the mass of the sun, four pi squared, you could plug in A. However, if we're in the solar system, if T is in Earth years and A is in AU, not this number, but actually just a whole number AU, then this goes away. Then you can use T squared is equal to A to the third solar system only. Okay. So in our solar system, we can use T squared is equal to A to the third. Now, what is the period of the Earth? One. So one squared is equal to A cubed. The cube of one is one. And we see that A is one AU. So as long as A is in AU and T is in time. So a better one would be what is the period of Jupiter if you know how far away Jupiter is. Um, and it turns out that Jupiter is 5.2 AU away. So if Jupiter is 5.2 AU, the period of Jupiter is the square root of a cubed of Jupiter, which is simply the square root of 5.2 cubed. That turns out to be 140 squared, which is 11.86 years. So we have a period of Jupiter. Jupiter goes around the sun every 11.86 Earth years. Pretty simple stuff. Um, you could have plugged in G and the mass of the sun, all this stuff right here if you wanted to. But if T is in Earth years and A is in AU, you get the right answer. If you're not in Earth years and AU, you need to put it in seconds and meters because G is obvious in SI, M is in SI, okay? So the units don't work. How you get Earth years squared is equal to AU cubed. But the, um, the uh, factor, this factor ends up being um, essentially uh, Earth years squared over AU cubed. So Earth years over meters squared or whatever, over meters cubed. Not a huge deal, um, but let's go and write this as, so Kepler's first law, ellipses, sun at one foci. Kepler's second law was equal area, equal time. Um, equal time, which really told us, um, and this told us our P was A and our A was A. 1 minus E, 1 plus E, and RP plus RA was 2A. Uh, equal area, equal time told us that V at perihelion times R at perihelion was equal to V at aphelion times R at aphelion. Um, and our final, Kepler's final law, told us that T squared was equal to 4 pi squared G over the mass that you're orbiting. Um, 
times a cubed where a is the semi-major. And if you're in our solar system, if T in Earth years and A in AU, then um, T squared is equal to A cubed. And that's it. That's everything you need to know about Kepler. Um, Kepler's three laws. Given some RP and RA, can you find everything else? Well, you would also need to be given uh, VP and a VA. Um, <laughs> next time, when we, uh, we're going to go through some problems where things are orbiting, and we're going to talk about how to find the potential energy and the kinetic energy of rotation for orbiting objects. But for now, for today, the only thing I really want you to, to be able to concentrate on is no Kepler's three laws, understand how these things work, um, and be able to find things like period, um, and also understanding just the universal law of gravity. And then we'll talk about those more, as I said, later in the week, uh, probably Wednesday, I'll post the second video, which is going to be a lot more math and not quite as fun, but um, there's some interesting stuff to learn from it. Anyway, stay healthy. Um, talk to you next time.